today's teaching, we'll be covering on dispensationalism. This teaching is very important because there are so many different wrong doctrines out there, and it's very difficult nowadays to find right doctrine. There are too many religions out there, too. What I want to recommend to peop all the people out there, I want to highly recommend this. If you want to find right doctrine, dispensationalism is the foundation for that. If you don't have that, you will never find the truth in the Word of God. Amen. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. So to find truth in God's word, you notice you have to rightly divide. Right. And that's what dispensationalism is. It is a basic foundation where we come up with rightly dividing the Bible. The word dispensation, according to Noah's Webster's 1828 dictionary, it means to administer things to different people. So that is very important, all right? So just like a dispenser, dispense, right? You give things out, right? So dispensation, what's very important to understand is that you give it, but to different people, you see? So if you were to study, see, about all these different people that God gave, you see? If you are to study all this, it will solve a lot of problem and you'll understand which doctrine applies to you, all right? And which doctrine applies to other people. So let's start it out. Let's start off with creation right here. Let's start off with creation right here. So notice that it begins with Adam. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. Verses 16 through 17. What's important about this is that you'll notice that there is a works salvation here. Now you might ask, why is there a works salvation, Pastor? Well, it's very simple. Because God said to Adam and Eve, now this should be a basic for anybody, even if you're an atheist, right? If you eat the fruit, then you'll be lost, right? You are not saved if you eat the fruit, right? You are lost. So that's just common sense. So this automatically shows that salvation by grace through faith, you see, salvation by grace through faith without works has not been the same from Adam all the way to the end. That's impossible, that's right. you see. The basic first step that anyone should know was that there was a works salvation. I mean, that is works. Don't eat the fruit. Yeah. I mean, are we doing that today? Don't eat the fruit? Yeah. No, a lot of us are eating fruit today, okay? Not, so, don't eat the fruit. That's his salvation, you see? And that does not apply to us. Amen. And this shows that there is a different salvation plan, Amen. you see? So, there are independent, fundamental Baptist churches that teach salvation has been the same from beginning to end. That is wrong. Amen. That's right. Because even a Sunday school kid should know this, you see. That's right. Look at Genesis chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 16 through 17. Notice what God told Adam and Eve. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You see? So they will die, notice, if they eat the fruit. And that does not apply to us today, obviously. All right, let's also look at Genesis, uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. Romans chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. So, Genesis chapter 1 through 3, you notice, that's creation, you see. These different ages, you'll notice, all right, these are all found in Clarence Larkin's dispensational chart, all right? So, we believe that there are different ages of time, and you'll see, notice right here, a first coming of Christ, and then you'll see right here a second coming of Christ as well, all right, in between these ages of time. And you're going to see different people involved in those ages of time, okay? Now let's look at Romans chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. Now we're under conscience. Notice that Noah and Abraham, they're under conscience. Meaning that their salvation plan is going to have to go by works, 
under conscience. It's going to be faith and works under conscience. That is very important. Because notice right here, the Bible reads in verse 13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So notice you are justified, see? You are saved if you do the law. But we got a problem. The law was all the way here at Moses. It wasn't over here before the law. So the law is their conscience, because keep reading. The Bible says at verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, right? They don't have the law. What happens? Do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. You see? So their conscience knows the law, what's right and wrong. I mean, let's be honest, when we grew up, ever since we were little kids and we're growing up and our conscience mature more and more, we're getting an idea of what's wrong and what's right, right? Yeah. So God's going to judge you according to your conscience. So it was faith and works under conscience. The next passage is Genesis. Go to the book of Genesis. And we're going to look at chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 5, and then 8 and 9. Verse 5, and then 8 through 9. Noah, he was saved, notice, faith and works under conscience. You will notice that. He had to follow what is faith and what is works under conscience. Let's look at that. Verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now look at this, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So their conscience is corrupted, notice. And God, what did he do? He drowned the whole world, right? He drowned the whole lost world. They were lost. They were not saved. But there was one exception that did not follow the corruption in his conscience, but what is right in his conscience. And that was Noah. Because look at verse 8. The Bible reads, But, see, so there's an exception to that corrupted conscience. Someone followed the good conscience. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Why did he find grace? Because verse 9, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. You see, so notice that Noah is different from us in salvation, you see. He had to... Follow what is just and right in his conscience. And that's why Noah, what happened to him? He wasn't like the lost world drowned out by God. He was saved, you see. If Noah did not build the ark, if Noah did not live right with God, would he be considered a saved person? No, he would be just like the lost world, right? That God would have drowned out. So his salvation notice is very different from Christians, you see. Because Christians, we did not build an ark and a boat to save our lives. And let's be honest, Christians, they many times fail on what is right in their conscience, right? You see? So it is very, very different. Also notice James chapter 2. James chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 21 through 24. Notice that Abraham, as well, had to do faith and works on what is right under conscience. All right? Look at James chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 21 through 24. To say that Abraham's salvation by grace through faith without works is the same as us is definitely wrong. Amen. All right? Look at James chapter 2. We will look at verse 21. The Bible says, Was not Abraham our father justified by what? Works. When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Now look at verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. See, Abraham's faith had to be perfected by works. But are we Christians? Aren't our faith already is perfected by what Jesus Christ did for us? Amen. See, so this is very different from us, you see. Look at verse 24. 
Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. You see? So notice that it's not just faith alone, it was works too, what Abraham did. Now, we're going to look at something very important here. What's very important, though, is that there is also something spiritual involved. There's something spiritual involved as well. But before we dig into the spiritual, let's look at the physical nation of Israel. Go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. We're going to look at Genesis 17, verse 7 through 8. 7 through 8. Then once you have that, I want your other hand to go to Judges. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Notice that there is a physical Israel, physical nation of Israel that started, you see. And that covenant with Israel is forever. It's forever. Look at Genesis chapter 17. We will look at verses 7 through 8. Verse 7 through 8. So there is a heresy. You'll notice right here that there is a heresy called replacement theology. You see, replacement theology. Replacement theology, they believe that they have replaced the nation of Israel. That is not true. Because God's covenant with Abraham about the physical Israel is forever. Right. You see, it's forever. Look at Genesis chapter 17. We will look at verse... 7 through 8. The Bible says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. So notice that Abraham's children, you see, that's where all the Jews came from, right? All the Jews came from Abraham. His seed is going to be forever, you see. And verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. You see? So that nation of Israel, the whole thing should belong to them. You see? It should not be shared by what they call Palestinians now. It shouldn't be shared by any other religion or even Christians. That nation belongs to physical Jews. You see? Now, look at Judges. Look at Judges. Some people might say, well, no, it does apply to me. I am the Jew. Can you believe that? People actually say that. People actually say that they replace physical Jews. What nonsense. Amen. When they say God made the covenant with Abraham, it was for Christians. It wasn't for Jews. Well, that's just nonsense because look at Judges 2 verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I brought you unto the land. Okay, so who did God deliver out of Egypt? Was it Christians? No, it's common sense, physical Jews, right? So this is to Jews. But look what God said. Which I swear unto your fathers. See? So the Jews' forefathers, all the way from Abraham. Keep reading. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Amen. You see? Amen. So this heresy replacement theology is definitely out. That's you right. see? You'll see this other heresy, covenant theology, covenant of grace. Uh, this theology, what they believe is that grace, salvation by grace, was the same ever since from the fall of Adam to the end. Nonsense. Right. That is nonsense. You already saw how Noah and Abraham, their salvation had works involved. You see, it was very different from us. So Calvinism believes in covenant theology. You see, they believe in this. But not only that, independent, fundamental, King James only churches believe in this heresy. Yeah. Surprisingly. And they will call themselves dispensationalists. You see, but if they are dispensationalists, why do they follow this heresy? Covenant theology, you must understand, which branches from a lot of Calvinists, they, that theology is the enemy camp of dispensationalism. That's pretty funny, isn't it? Yeah. It's a pretty funny world we live in. But then there are people who call themselves dispensationalists who believe in this. Hilarious, isn't it? All right, now let's look at Genesis 15. Genesis 15. We're going to look at verse 5 through 6. Genesis 15, and then verse 5 through 6. Now, once you have Genesis 15, I want your other hand to go to Romans 4. Romans 4. 
And then we're going to look at verse 2 through 3. Romans 4, verse 2 through 3. Now, this is very important. What's very important is that there are also spiritual dealings of God involved. All right? Now, what do I mean by that? All right, let me explain here. Do you see this bar right here? So you'll notice right here that this bar, that Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, John, etc., you got to realize this. God gave physical dealings in the Bible and spiritual dealings in the Bible. Now, this is very vital. If you do not understand this, you will come across wrong doctrine. When Adam died, his spirit died, you must understand. So when his spirit died, God can't base it off on spiritual dealings. All right? What does he have to deal with Adam then, if not spiritual? Physical. Amen. Yeah. You see? That's why it makes sense Noah and Abraham, they had to do physical works yes. to get their salvation. Do you understand? Yeah. See, they can't do faith alone in Jesus Christ because that's spiritual. You see that? That's right. Christians, we can do that because we have a lively spiritual nature. And we'll talk about that more. So what is absolutely vital to understand is that throughout this time period, it was physical dealings. And if it's physical dealings, then God is dealing with physical nations. Amen. That's why right here, He was doing a physical Israel. See, physical Jews. Not spiritual Jews. That's what replacement theology wants to say. You see? But it's physical, literal Jews, because God had to deal with them physically. And physical Gentiles, you see. There was no such thing called a spiritual nation, called a Christian church. There was no such thing. It had to be physical, you see. But what we got to understand is this. What we got to understand is that, well, God, the foundation is physical dealings. So if God wanted to do spiritual dealings, He had to base it on physical. So you see this? You see that? So, physical dealings is the basis, and then spiritual dealings is going to have to follow this. Now, this is what's very vital to understand, too. The reason why Old Testament Judaism, so that's another heresy we got to cover. Old Testament Judaism, they do not understand spiritual doctrines that Christians believe in, is that they only focus on physical, you see. Not spiritual. You got to realize this. Throughout Genesis uh, 4 through 50 and the book of Job, that's under conscience, you realize. Genesis 4 through 50 and the book of Job, that's under this age, this time period, conscience. During this time period, what we got to understand is that God was not just only doing, doing physical dealings, there were some spiritual dealings involved too that God did. And that's where Christians get their doctrine from. So look at Abraham. He had a spiritual dealing of God. Really, Pastor? It was spiritual? Yeah. Because you're going to notice right here that it was only by faith, just faith, that he received the imputed righteousness of God, not physical works. Look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted to him for what? Righteousness. See, it wasn't works. It was faith. That's, right. That's why Paul, so it's understandable, look at Romans 4. Look at Romans 4. That's why Paul was able to pull up Old Testament verses to prove spiritual Christian doctrines. You see that? That's why he was able to do that. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 2 through 3. Verses 2 through 3. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So notice Paul was able to argue to Jews, Hey, Abraham right here, he was counted righteous... Not by his works, but faith alone, you see. Now, this is confusing, is it not? So you go, wait, wait a minute. I thought that you said Abraham right here at the book of James was faith and works. This is why you have to divide. You know what the division is? This is Genesis 15. Yeah. You know when Abraham, it was faith, not works. 
You see, Genesis 15. In James 2, you know where he got the works? Years and years later when he sacrificed Isaac. You see that? Years and years later. So then that verse was saying, faith perfected, what? Later on by works. No contradiction. You see? But I guarantee you this, every single denomination and church, they don't know that. They're either going to say this, instead of splitting the two as one as faith and works and the other faith not works, they're going to try to combine these two together and say it's either faith not works or they're going to say, oh no, it was faith and works, you see. But if you divide it, it becomes more simple, you see. No, this verse said faith and works. This verse said faith not works. So let's just divide it. This one happened at Genesis 15. This one happened long after, years and years later, when he sacrificed Isaac, you see. So what is very important is this, is that during this time period, God was basing it on physical dealings. That's the basis. But don't overlook the spiritual dealings that he did too. All right? So there's a heresy called hyper-dispensationalism. Hyper-dispensationalism, what they believe is that they do believe you have to divide, you see. But this is their problem. They think there is nothing spiritual Christian doctrine involved until all the way over here. All the way over here. And they, sit, they think that right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, there was nothing spiritual Christian. No, there is. You saw one right here that Paul used. You see? Otherwise, Paul would be lying, would he not? You see? So that's why you have to avoid these guys. So these guys, if you hear them say, oh, this is Jewish, not Christian. This is Jewish, not Christian. This is Jewish, not Christian. That should be a warning light to you. You should be very careful. Yeah. Because yes, it is true. A lot of it was based on physical dealings, Jews. But don't forget the spiritual dealings right here too. There are some spiritual dealings that God did. Okay? Now, let's look at another passage. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, please. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 18. Deuteronomy 32, and we will look at verse 18 through 22. And then you're going to compare that with Psalms chapter 9 and verse 17. Psalms 9, 17. So Deuteronomy 32, verse 18 through 22... And then you're going to do Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. Now, this passage shows that during the time of the law, it had to be faith and works. It had to be faith and works for salvation. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're going to look at verses 18 through 22. So they had to follow the law of Moses. That's where the law came from, right? It came from Moses. So when it came from Moses, you got to realize this. When it came from Moses, that was their salvation plan. They had to follow the works of the law. Look at verse 18. The Bible says, Of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Okay, it's notice, this nation of Israel forgets God. And when you forget God, what happens? Verse 19. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom, uh-oh, is no faith. You see, God does not count them as people having faith if you've forgotten God. Now, how many Christians say by faith today have forgotten God Amen. in their walk? Right. All right, so this is problematic. Now, look at verse 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. And look at this. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto what? The lowest hell. You see? So if their daily life, they forget God and they turn unto vanities, you see, if they fail in the works, 
what happens? They go to hell. Right. But compare that with Psalms 9. You have your hand there, right? Compare that with Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. If you forget God, you know what happens to you? You go to hell. That's right. Look at Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that what? Forget God. Yeah. You see? You go to hell if you forget God. All right? So notice right here that it was definitely faith and works with Moses and the Jews. Let's also look at Psalms chapter 51, verse 11 through 12. Psalms chapter 51, and then verse 11 through 12. We're going to look at David too. David. David, he realized that faith and works was the salvation plan. Look at Psalms chapter 51. Psalms chapter 51. We're going to look at verses 11 through 12. Verses 11 through 12. Notice that David realized that he can lose the Holy Spirit for his salvation by his sin. You see? Which is very different from Christians. We believe that even if we fail in our works, we can never lose salvation in the Holy Spirit. Right. Look at Psalms chapter 51, verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You see that? So notice that David was even concerned about losing his salvation. He realized faith and works was the plan. All right, let's also look at 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. We're going to look at verse... 1 Kings chapter 2, and then verse 3. Verse 3. So you notice that the salvation plan was faith and works. There was no doubt about that. Now remember, why did God have to do works for salvation? Why is it physical works? Because remember, when Adam sinned against God, the spirit died, right? Amen. So God can't do spiritual dealings. He has to deal with them physically. That's why physical works were necessary for salvation, you see? But remember, even though the basis is physical dealings, works, that doesn't mean there were no spiritual dealings involved. There were some spiritual dealings. That's why it's faith and works. You see that? That's why right here, faith and works. You see that? Spiritual and physical. Spiritual and physical. You see that? Look at 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. I mean, let's be honest, guys, and for people online who study the Bible, are you going to really deny that there was absolutely zero spiritual dealings in the entire Old Testament? I mean, honestly, you can't. That's far of a stretch, you see. If you read the whole Amen. Old Testament, if you're going to be very honest, you're going to realize, you know what? There were some spiritual dealings. That's right. There had to be some spiritual dealings. Not everything was only physical. But it was mainly physical, though, right? See, that's why it's the basis. It's mainly. Look at 1 Kings chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 3. Verse 3. Notice that prosperity, physical prosperity, is involved by their physical works. Because remember, it's physical dealings. Look at 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in His way, see physical works, to keep His statutes, physical works, and His commandment, physical works, and His judgment, and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. So this was during the law. That thou mayest see prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. See? So there is prosperity involved, you see, by their physical works. Now, this is a heresy now, though, okay? Notice uh, that prosperity gospel, I was not able to write it here, I think, so I'm going to write it over here. Prosperity gospel is another heresy you should, you should avoid. Amen. Because this heresy is preached by Joel Osteen and many other preachers today where, hey, you know, give a lot of physical money to God. Make sure you do a lot of physical good works and then God will richly bless your life. That's not true, right? If we're honest Christians, many times when you serve God rightly, instead of getting physical success, it seems like more lack of physical success. It's more like persecution. Execution, hardship and suffering right. yeah. you see they're going to a wrong time period wrong group of people yeah. we're all the way here see this is all the way back here you see 
See, they, they got, they, they're mixing up something, you see. They got the wrong idea. All right, let's also look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. Exodus chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Now, because God is physically dealing, see, with physical Jews, then if He's going to prove His power to them, He's going to have to use physical signs and wonders. You see that? That's right. So that's where we get the idea of speaking of tongues, of healings, and all these uh, physical signs going on. But these were given to Jews. Amen. This is not Christian. We're all the way over there. That's right. This is all the way back here to Jews. You see? Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. The very first sign given, it was intended for Jews to believe. Because Jews weren't going to believe Moses on what he said. So God said, Moses, then you're going to do these physical signs right. to prove to these physical Jews yeah. my power. Verse 1, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. See, they're not going to believe me. And then verse 2, see, rod turning into snake. Verse 2, 3, and 4. See? Yep. Verse 5, they will believe. Verse 6, here's a second sign. Put your hand in your cloak, and then it will become leprous. Verse 7, put it again, and then it will be back to normal. Verse 8, this is important. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first what? Sign. sign. That's the very first sign in the entire Bible. And it was to Jews, you see. And that they will believe the voice of the latter sign, you see. That was intended for Jews, you yeah, see. Right. Not Christians. We're all the way over there, you see. This was for Jews, you see. Because why? God is dealing with physical dealings with physical people. So it's Jews and Gentiles. There is no spiritual group of people yet called Christians, you see. That's right. All right, let's also... Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 22. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 22. Once you have Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 22, we're going to also look at Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. Romans chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Now, remember, church, this is very important, okay? Can we believe that there were sp some spiritual dealings during this time period? Yes. There had to be, all right? So, we're going to look at some of the spiritual dealings here, which is what Jews overlook. So, Old Testament Judaism, see, they focus so much on physical things, they overlook the spiritual things behind the scenes going on. That's very important to know. Hyper-dispensationalists, too, they all focus physical Jew, physical Jew, but they don't see spiritual doctrines that are Christian that they can see. So this will be very, this is why this is important, because this will be very powerful to use to convince the Jews that in their Old Testament, that Christian doctrine is genuine and real, you see? So this is very important. Let's look at Romans chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 20 through 22. Now, this is one of my favorites. This, will con this is what you can use powerfully for Jews. You know how you can powerfully convince Jews that they cannot be saved by their law? Because the works of law are imperfect compared to what? God. Now, during this time period, they did not have the righteousness and the, of Jesus Christ. This is long after, you see. So they couldn't get that yet, you see. So that's why it was what? Faith and works for salvation. But now that we have this, see, the righteousness of God by Jesus Christ's sacrifice, what looks better? Is this more, isn't this more perfect than doing your work on the law? Amen. So this is a powerful argument. So you can show them that they're imperfect to God. And they sh if they're an honest Jew, they're going to admit that. 
They're going to admit that. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law can't save you. Why? Because comparing that to what Jesus did on the cross, his righteousness. Verse 21. But now, see that right? See now. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross, so we can have that now. Now, but they didn't have that back then. See? So they couldn't do that. Now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. You see? You know, the Jews, if they're very honest, they do not keep the law of Moses. Didn't you know that? Amen. They're not continuing blood sacrifices. And that is very vital for them to get forgiveness of sins for their salvation. They don't practice circumcision. And circumcision was also necessary to follow the law for their salvation. A lot of them don't follow that. They have, they've uh, lowered the standards of circumcision. You'd be surprised about that. So you see, this will be a powerful argument against Old Testament Judaism, you see. And making them see that they can't get saved the way they're doing, and they need Jesus Christ. Amen. But also, this debunks this hyper-dispensational heresy yes. that there is nothing spiritual Christian that you can find in the Old Testament. And they cut off the Old Testament from you. No, you can't do that. Christians can learn something from Old Testament. I mean, look at this, man. It's spiritual meaning. Not only that, let's also look at Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. You know what's another powerful evidence is David. David. Because he has faith, not works. Really, Pastor? Yeah. Because you know what he did? He broke the law of Moses by committing adultery and murder. Now, he should be put to death, you see. Adultery and murder. But God spared him. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. When David killed Uriah the Hittite and committed adultery, he should have been stoned to death by the law of Moses, but despite of that failure of physical works, what did God do? I'll just forgive you anyway. See, he just gave him forgiveness without works. Right. You see? So notice right here that there was something spiritual involved. You see that? That's right. But that did not mean that David ignored, realized, and ignored the I truth that there were faith and works during his time period, right? He realized that nevertheless, you see? He realized that nevertheless. But God made him an exception with his sin of adultery and murder. Because if you read his life about how, in the book of Psalms, he had a strong works with God, works relationship with God. He was very close to God, you see. He had a very soft heart. All right, now let's look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Matthew chapter, excuse me, Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, verse, Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 15. Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15. In that passage, you're going to find out that there was prophecies about the Messiah as king and sufferer. King and sufferer. Okay? So this is very, very important. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 30, 13 through 15. Now, what's very important to know about this is that the Jews, they're looking forward to a kingly Messiah, you see, a physical kingdom, because that's what God promised the Jews. God promised the Jews that they will have a physical kingdom under a physical messianic king, okay? So the Jews know that. That's what we believe. So that's an important thing to understand, because the idea of the kingdom, you'll see that especially at the end, because that's what they're looking for, you see, a physical messianic king. But this is the part they ignore. They also got to realize that he's also a sufferer too. He's a sufferer too. That's the part that the Jews, Old Testament Judaism, ignore. Look at Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. 
The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. You see that? So, the Messiah... God's servant is going to be like a kingly reign. You see, exalted very high. But look at verse 14, his suffering too. As many were astonished at the, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So notice that he's going to be a sufferer too. Because his countenance, see his appearance, is going to be so marred more than anybody that it's going to be unrecognizable. And when Jesus died on the cross, didn't he go through a, a countenance appearance that was marred, so marred badly, you could barely recognize him as a man through that bloody sacrifice, you see. Verse 15, So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them they, shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Notice right here that, see, kings involved. You see that? So there is a messianic king involved. So this is important to know. Messiah as king and suffer. You know why that's important? Because by ignoring him as king and suffer, you're going to come up with a ton of wrong doctrine later. All right? And let's cover that now. His first coming. So Jesus Christ came, right? That's his first coming. Jews, when they think about the coming of the Messiah, see, they only think one coming. But they don't see that as first coming and second coming. Why? Because remember the prophecy of Isaiah? Not just Isaiah, but so many, tons of passages in the Old Testament prophesying the Messiah. They said He's going to come as King and suffer. So His first coming, Jesus comes as suffer. See, dying on the cross. But His second coming as King, you see? That's why you have to believe in dividing. If you don't believe in dispensationalism and dividing, you're no different from Old Testament Judaism. You see that? So you can't blame the Jews on what they believe in. Their belief is right. You see? Their belief is right, but it's in what? It's not divided. You see, they don't divide it. It's only part of the bigger picture here, you see? So let's look at... Matthew chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 3 and verses 1 through 12. Now when John the Baptist came to the scene, okay, so John the Baptist came to the scene, notice that water baptism and works of repentance are involved for salvation, okay? Water baptism and works of repentance are involved for salvation, So you're going to see Paul Washer, Ray Comfort, and many people of Lordship Salvation. All right, that's another heresy. Lordship Salvation, what kind of heresy that is, is that they believe that you have to repent for salvation. Now, we believe repent for salvation, don't get me wrong, but they believe that there are works involved, you see, that after you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, that your life afterwards, good works, should be very, very clean. There's going to be good works, very good in good works. But, and they use this text, Matthew 3, verse 1 through 12. But, look, look, we're all the way over here again, you see. This is John the Baptist Dealing with what? Jews, see? Physical dealings. Let's look at right here, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of where? Judea. Jews, you see? Not Christians. Jews, okay? So if God is dealing with physical people, Jews then isn't his dealings going to be physical? Yes, it's going to be physical dealings, okay? So think about this now, okay. So if God's going to deal with them physically, then it's going to be expected I'm going to see physical things involved. So physical signs and wonders, physical works, and physical water baptism, you see? So they're going to have to have that for their salvation, for their movement. Look at verse 2. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're going to look at verse 5 and 6. Verse 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. You see that? Jews. 
and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Uh, verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. You see that? And if they don't do that, then what's going to happen? Verse 10, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. You see that? You're going to be cast into the fire. You're going to go to hell if you don't do what? Verse 8, works of repentance. You see? If you don't do what? If you don't do verse 6, baptism, water baptism. And how many religions teach that? You see? But who is this for? Physical Jews during this time period. We're all the way over there again. Wrong group of people, wrong time period. You see? Let's also look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. Matthew 11, verse 12. And then we're also going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, all the way to chapter 5. I'm going to write the verses for chapter 5. I'm going to squeeze it. 3, 20, and 22. All right? Hopefully the people online can see that. All right? Now, in this one, we're going to see kingdom of heaven, which is a physical kingdom. All right? Now, you're going to notice that throughout the Bible, during this first coming, during the ministry of Jesus and John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned a lot, right? Now, what you got to understand is the kingdom of heaven is not going to heaven. The kingdom of heaven, because remember, God is dealing physically, right? So it's going to be a physical, earthly kingdom. Remember the prophecy? The prophecy, Messiah as king? That's what they were expecting, right? An earthly kingdom with an earthly ruler, you see? So, during this, obviously, when this is preached... It was talking about an earthly kingdom and earthly ruler. Well, pastor, how do you know that the kingdom of heaven is an earthly kingdom? That's not talking about going up to heaven. Well, let's first look at Matthew 11, verse 12. Let's first look at Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. This, this has to be earthly. It cannot be something up in heaven. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now... The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. How can that be heaven, up in heaven? The violent people on earth, they can't take away heaven. But it makes sense that they are fighting for what? A physical earthly kingdom. That makes more sense, you see? So there's no doubt this has to be a physical earthly kingdom. But not only that, it makes sense it has to be a physical earthly kingdom because the Old Testament, there were too many prophecies talking about that. They were expecting that, you see? So there were so many prophecies about that. Now let's look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 3. Chapter 5, verse 3. Uh, excuse me, chapter 4 first. Chapter 4 and verse 23. Chapter 4 and verse 23. Notice that who is this going to be preached to then? It's not going to be spiritual Christians then, right? Because this is a physical earthly kingdom, not spiritual. So who's it going to be then? If you, can, if you notice throughout this whole thing we talked about, it's going to be physical Jews, right? Because look at Matthew 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee. You see that? Jews teaching in their synagogues. Well, that's definitely Jew. And preaching the gospel. Did it say the gospel of Jesus Christ? The gospel of Paul? The Christian gospel? No, it says the gospel of the what? Kingdom. You see that? Kingdom. That's expected, right? Because what? That's what they're looking for. Messiah as king. So, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, we see that. So, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So, what's he going to preach? Look at Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right? So, Jesus Christ is preaching about the physical kingdom, right? That's the gospel of the kingdom. So, earthly kingdom. Now, notice the salvation plan of this earthly kingdom. Okay? Follow the context now. From verse 3, go all the way down to verse 20 now. Verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed 
the righteousness of the Pharisees, he shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at that. So your physical work of being a good person has to exceed even the religious leader, scribes and Pharisees. Wow, that's a lot of work, you see. Why? Because remember, God is dealing physically and Jews are physical people. So it makes sense that physical works, see, of righteousness is involved for their salvation. You see that? So what's very important is that works are involved for salvation in this kingdom, all right? This physical kingdom. That's important, all right? That's important. Let's also look at Matthew chapter 24. Uh, excuse me, I forgot verse 22. Look at this. This is definitely not a Christian. Look at verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Reka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of what? Hell fire. You go to hell for saying fool. Well, guess what? I think Joel Osteen is a fool. Oh, am I going to hell now? Am I in trouble? No, because what? This is what? Related to a physical kingdom. You see that? Now, it would make sense why you shouldn't call each other fools in the kingdom. You know why? Because if God is ruling in a physical kingdom on earth, and He is taking care of His own people, it is wrong for His own people, one saint, to call the other saint, you're a fool, you see? There are no bad guys in the earthly kingdom, you see, that God's going to rule on the earth. There are no bad guys. But today, we have plenty of bad guys Amen. that are fools, you see. So you see why it makes sense? See, it makes sense, you see. If you make this Christian, that does not make any sense at all, you see. Yeah. Because Paul said, Paul called false prophets and false people fools. Jesus even said the word fool. Are they going to hell? No. But it would make sense that you will go to hell for saying fool if God is ruling in an earthly kingdom right now with a bunch of good guys there. That's right. You see? Let's also look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. We're going to look at verse 3. Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to look at verse 3. Now, here's something very important, okay? What you're going to find out as well is that Jesus Christ, He talked about end times Jewish things, all right? That is very important to know. He talked about end times Jewish things, okay? Now, you know why that's important? All right? Why that's important is because Jesus Christ talked about works for salvation, and He also talked about a rapture for the tribulation. He talked about a rapture after the tribulation, not before. Jesus Christ mentioned that there was a rapture after the tribulation, not before. But this is not going to be for spiritual Christians. This is going to be related to what? Jewish. Okay? Look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. The Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Okay, so the disciples are asking him, what's going to happen at the end times? Okay, so Jesus Christ here, he's going to talk about what's going to happen at the end times. We're going to look at verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You see that? You have to endure to the end. A lot of physical works to be saved during the end times. That's what Jesus said. So that's very important is that there are works involved for salvation during the tribulation. And it's for Jewish people because look at verse 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. You see, it's for Jews. You see that? It's for Jews at verse 16. We're also going to look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 16 now, okay? Now, this is what's going to be very important. Following the context of verse 16, we notice that this is for Jews, right? It's going to be for Jews. And what did God say about these Jews? 
that they're going to be raptured after the tribulation. Because let's read one by one. Let's read verse 19. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. So during the tribulation, there's going to be a lot of woe. And if you have child, it's going to be a woeful time for you, you see. Let's also look at verse 29. Man, this tribulation time period is not fun. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So this is after the tribulation, see? So what's going to happen after the tribulation? There's going to be a rapture. Because look at verse 31. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. You see, they're going to gather together God's elect people up to heaven. And this is when, verse 29, after the tribulation, you see. So notice that there is a rapture. Notice there is a rapture after the tribulation. But this is for what? This is not for spiritual Christians. This was for who? Jews. Remember verse 16? Jews, you see? Jews. Now, what we got to understand is that this tribulation time period is also called wrath. It's also called wrath. Because look at Luke 21 now. Luke chapter 21. We're going to look at verse 21. Luke chapter 21. We're going to look at verses 21 through 23. Luke chapter 21. We're going to look at verses 21 through 23. Now, there is a heresy called post-tribulation rapture. Right here. Post-tribulation rapture. In other words, these people believe that Christians are going to go through the tribulation and then after the tribulation, they will get raptured. That's a heresy. Amen. That is a heresy. Because why? That rapture is for what? Jews. Yep. All right. Look at Luke chapter 21, verse 21. The Bible says, Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Oh, remember what Matthew 24 said? Matthew 24 about the tribulation? Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. So this is the same thing then, we know. This is the same thing as Matthew 24 about the tribulation. So this is a tribulation. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Ah, remember Matthew 24 we read earlier? That during the tribulation, woe unto you if you have child and take care of them, right? But what is that period called? Keep reading. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. So notice that this time period of the tribulation is called wrath. Now that's important because post-tribulation rapture people, they think that they're going to go through the tribulation but after the tribulation, they're going to get raptured before the wrath of God. What? That doesn't make sense. You might go, some of you are going, what? I don't get it. Isn't the wrath the same as the tribulation? Yeah. So they don't know what they're talking about. You see? They think the wrath is after the tribulation. No, you already read the verse. The wrath is during the tribulation. You see? They don't realize that. All right. Let's also... Look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Now, what's very, very important is this. Jesus Christ, was He not born of the Holy Ghost when He was born out of the womb of the Virgin Mary? Yeah, He was born of the Holy Ghost. So, since He was born of the Holy Spirit... He has the authority to introduce spiritual things. That's right. So look at this, see? Physical dealings, right? And then spiritual dealings that follow that. But look at this now. From Jesus, what's going on? You see? Spiritual things are forming now, you yeah. see? Amen. Spiritual right. things are forming. And notice this switch now. Spiritual church, see the Christians, is going to be bigger than physical dealings. So whenever God does physical dealings, it's going to be based on this one as the main thing, as the primordial, spiritual. 
But this is important. You see this? It's not completely black, right? It's partially. You know why? Jesus is introducing. There's still a lot of Jewish things. You see that? There's still a lot of physical dealings in Jewish. You see? So there's going to be spiritual things and physical. So this is what Bible-believing dispensationalists believe. We believe that there was a transition, you see, spiritual and physical, during Jesus, Apostles, Paul, Paul, and that's it. And then right here from Christians, it was completely spiritual. You see, not a single white whiteness. It's all spiritual, black. We believe Paul, Apostles, Jesus, Jesus there was a transition going on. All right. Why was there a transition, Pastor? Why was there a transition? You know why? Because God was about to turn from physical Jews into a spiritual church. Amen. That's right. That's why. And the reason why God was doing that is because the physical nation of Israel, they were going to reject Jesus. So because they were rejecting Jesus, God was trying to turn it over eventually to the church. But he didn't do it completely. He didn't just cut off the Jews like that and jump to the church. He didn't do that. You know why? Because just like how God deals with you and I, when God's about to cut you off, he doesn't just start cut you off immediately like that and go to a new guy, right? What he does is that his punishment, his dealing with you when he cuts you off, is gradual. You know why? Because it's out of mercy. Amen. See? So out of mercy... God was gradually cutting off the Jews. But you notice more and more, gradually, more and more and more and more and more and more. And then after Paul, they're done. Yep. They're done. Now, I'll explain that more when we hit here, all right? But that's important to understand, you see. So what is very important is that during these time periods, during these people, there was a transition going on with Jews and church. So when you look at the, their books, these books of the Bible, see, when you look at these books of the Bible, there is Christian, transition of Christian and Jewish, physical. There's a transition. It's not cleanly cut off. That's important to realize. That is very important to realize. If you don't realize that, you're going to get a messed up bunch of doctrine. Yeah. All right? Yeah, that's right. Look at John chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 23. So remember, Jesus Christ, He has the authority to introduce spiritual things. So look at John chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 23. The Bible says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Look at that. Jesus Christ said the hours is going to come where it's going to be spiritual. Yep. You see, that is important to know. So there are spiritual things forming here. And that's why when you read Matthew, the books of Matthew to John, when you read these books, Matthew to John, you're going to see a lot of spiritual Christian doctrine in there. But at the same time, you're going to see a lot a physical Jewish doctrine too, remember? Because he's dealing with Jews, remember? So Jesus Christ, he has the authority to introduce spiritual things. We're going to also look at these other passages where Jesus Christ was doing spiritual things. We're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 7, verse 47 through 50. Luke chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 47 through 50. You're going to see right here that Jesus Christ, He gave salvation without works. <clears throat> he gave salvation without works. So that's a spiritual Christian doctrine, you see. Luke chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 47 through 50. So there are no physical works involved for salvation. Luke chapter 7, verse 47 through 50. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. So notice right here that her sins were forgiven by what? Verse 50. Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. You see that? So without works, just faith. So that's something spiritual. That is not physical works. Another thing is Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Luke chapter 17 and verse 21. You're going to also see a spiritual kingdom here. 
a spiritual kingdom, which we call the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Look at Luke chapter 17 and we'll look at verse 21. Notice that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. So remember, we talked about kingdom of heaven, right? That's physical. And that's going to be different from the kingdom of God, which is spiritual. Look at Luke chapter 17. We'll look at verse 21. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. See, that proves the kingdom of God is spiritual. Because how can God's kingdom go inside you? You see? So it's not a physical kingdom. This has to be a spiritual kingdom. Let's also look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 5 through 6, Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 6. Once you have Matthew 10, your other hand to go to Matthew 21, Matthew 21. Once you have Matthew 10, your other hand to go to Matthew 21. Now, what you're going to notice is that Jesus, remember, he's dealing with Jews, right? But pretty soon, what you're going to notice is that while he's dealing with Jews, it's going to switch to non-Jewish. Okay, let me explain that a little more. Let's first look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So notice here, Jesus told them, we're not going to minister to non-Jews. He said, don't go to Gentile Samaritans. We're going to go to who? The house of Israel. So that's Jesus' ministry. So we got to understand Jesus' ministry is primarily Jewish, see? So because it's primarily Jewish, there's going to be a lot of physical dealings of God. See, Jews, it's primarily this. It's rarely this, you see, spiritual dealings. It's rarely this. But Jesus warned them, Jesus warned the Jews, if you reject it, what's going to happen? If you reject it, he's going to turn to non-Jews. That's where this comes in, you see that? And that's why these guys become gone, you see that? Because Jesus warned them that. Let's look at Matthew 21. Matthew 21. We're going to look at verse 43. The Bible says... Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Look at that. Jesus Christ told the Jews, the kingdom's going to be taken from you and it's going to be given to who? A, a nation that's non-Jewish, you see. So that's important. There's going to be, it's going to switch from Jewish to non-Jewish. That's why it's going to switch, see, from Jewish to more of what? Non-Jewish. You see that? That's what's going to be important. All right, so Jesus warned them that. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 9. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 9. So let's talk about the apostles now, okay? We're under the church age now, the church age. So the time period of the church age. In other words, the age of the church, okay? But you're going to notice from looking at that board, do you see that board, what a mess that is? Of, see, black and white, see, spiritual and physical. So there's going to be a lot of transitioning between spiritual church, the Christians, and physical Jews. All right, there's going to be a lot of transition. Now, this is very important to know about the apostles. The apostles, their ministry was primarily Jewish. That's very important to understand. Their ministry was primarily Jewish. Galatians chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 8 through 9. The Bible says, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, 
So Peter's apostleship is to who? The circumcision. Those are not. Uh, those are Jews. You see, Jews. Verse nine. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. So notice James, Cephas, and John are mentioned. And who are they to? That we should go unto the heathen, and they. That's James, Cephas, and John unto the circumcision, the Jews. So what's very important to know is this. The apostles, their ministry is primarily Jewish. So this is very important. This is very important to understand. The apostles, where is their learning from? Their learning is from Jesus Christ under Jesus' ministry, right? So since it's going to be under Jesus' ministry... What was Jesus' ministry, if you remember? It was primarily Jewish while introducing some spiritual Christian doctrines, right? Amen. So that's what's going on in the apostles' mind. So in their writings and teachings, you're going to see a lot primarily Jewish with some spiritual Christian doctrine in their writings. All right? So you see, this is totally different from Christians, you see? From Christians. This is going to be totally different from Christians, you see? Also, remember this. Jesus talked a lot about kingdom and end times, right? So, that's what the apostles were learning under. So, when the, in their writings, you're going to see a lot of end times events, too. So, when you read the book of Acts and the book of James to Revelation which are written by the apostles. See, we're not talking about Paul. We're talking about the apostles under Jesus' ministry. When you read their writings, it's going to be a lot of end times and Jewish stuff with some spiritual Christian doctrine. You see that? Because why? Because they were under Jesus' ministry and teaching all that. Okay, so let's look at this stuff. We're going to look at... Acts chapter 15, verse 9. Uh, excuse me. We're going to first look at James chapter 1, verse 1. James chapter 1, verse 1. All right. We're going to look at a lot of verses in the general epistles. We'll look at James chapter 1, verse 1. And then we're going to look at chapter 5, verse 3, and 2.24 later. All right. They're all written out here. James 1, 1, 5, 3, and 2.24. All right. So let's look at James the Apostle, okay? So his writing is not going to be a lot of Christian stuff where you can see. All right, look at James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to who? The twelve tribes. You see that? So, warning light, we're going to know that there's going to be some Jewish doctrines, Jewish teachings here. Let's look at James chapter 5, verse 3. James chapter 5 and verse 3. Warning light, James says there's going to be end times mentioned here. Look at James 5, verse 3. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped together, treasure together for what? The last days. You see? So, tribulation is going to be mentioned. Warning light. Let's also look at James 2.24. James 2.24. So, remember, remember, this is end times. This is Jewish, right? What's going to happen in end times in Jewish? What's the salvation plan? Works, right? Yep. Faith and works, right? That's what Jesus said during His ministry, right? Okay, so look at James 2.24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Makes sense why he said that, you yeah. see? Now let's look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. Once you have 1 Peter 1.18, you're going to look at verse 20. And then after verse 20, you're going to look at chapter 4 verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Then we're going to look at verse 20, and then chapter 4, and verse 18. Notice right here that 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Now look at this. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. 
So doesn't that sound Jewish, you see? It's a tradition they learned from their forefathers, you see? So this is not Gentile, non-Jewish. This, uh, this is Jewish, you see? So highlight, see, highlight Jewish. Not only that, end times, highlight. Look at verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in what? These last times. Oh, highlight, end times, tribulation. Okay, remember, if it's end times and if it's Jewish, what's going to be the salvation plan? Works, you see, works. So, that's why, look at ver chapter 4, verse 18. Chapter 4 and verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You see that? So that's why this verse sounds like that you would barely get saved by being a very righteous person, you see? And if you're wicked, you definitely are lost. See, works. You can see works right here, you see? Let's also look at 1 John. 1 John. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. 1 John 2, 18. Once you have 2, 18, then we're going to look at chapter 3, verse 14 through 15. Then once you have that, we're... Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, chapter 3, verse 14 through 15, and 1 John chapter 2, and verse 18. All right. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is what? The last time. So, oh, highlight end times. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Oh, the coming Antichrist. Highlight. So this is end times. That's why, look at chapter 3 now, verse 14 through 15. So remember, if it's end times, and we do know John, he ministered to Jews, right? That's what Galatians 2, 8 through 9 is. Okay, his, his ministry was primarily Jewish. What's going to be the salvation plan then? Works. Look at chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life, so we know that we're saved. Why? Because we love the brethren. See, it's a work. You have to love the brother. He that loveth not his brother, how many of you don't love your brother? Then abideth in death. <laughs> See? You get lost. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And the Bible says, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life then God doesn't consider you having eternal life. So I guess saved Christians had better start working on loving each other if we want to retain our salvation, you see? Yeah, if we want to think that way. But we obviously know we're not that, right? We do know that even though, I mean, let's be honest, in Christian churches it feels like you want to wring the neck off of some people, you know? And... Even if you do that, you're still saved no matter what. Because we're saved by faith alone, not by works. That's right. But see, end times Jewish. You see that? End times in Jewish, you see. Let's also look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4 through 5. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 through 5. We're also going to look... At chapter 8. Chapter 8. Now, remember, if the apostles' ministries are primarily Jewish, then it's going to be mostly physical dealings, right? So if it's going to be mostly physical dealings, then wouldn't it make sense that they would talk about water baptism? And they will also do the signs, you know, the speaking of tongues and the healing signs. And then also that they're going to have to do physical things to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. All right, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4 through 5. So this is where your signs, speaking of tongues, come from. Look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 4 through 5. The Bible says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, 
and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Charismatics and Pentecostals, they're the heresy of the signs movement and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, okay? They're all for this. They believe you have to speak in tongues, uh, you have to uh, get the laying of hands, some physical action to get the Holy Spirit, and then you go blabbity blab and speaking in tongues, and then you feel the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, hey, they're looking at, see, we're all the way here. You know what this is at? This is under who? Jews. Look at verse 5. And there were dwelling at where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jews. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. Why? Because remember, Jews are physical people. And when God is dealing physically with Jews, He's going to use physical things to deal with them. Water baptism? Physical. Signs? Physical. Getting the Holy Spirit baptism by physical actions, laying of hands, physical. See, this is not spiritual, you see. So that's why it makes sense. Now let's look at verse 38. How many people have you heard quote this verse for your salvation? Look at verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, you have to get water baptized to get saved and get the Holy Spirit baptism, which is what a lot of Pentecostals and Church of Christ and many other cults believe. That's right. But who is this again? That's not Christians. That's to who again? Jews. Amen. Why? Because, again, if you were from, we studied all this, right? Why? Because Jews are a physical people and God deals with them physically. All right? Physically. Not spiritual dealings, all right? Now, let's also look at Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Once you have Acts 15, we're going to look at verses 9 through 11, and then verses 23 through 24. Acts 15, verses 9 through 11, and then we're going to look at verses 23 through 24. Then once you have that, we're going to look at chapter 8, 36 through 38, and then third... I'm going to write these verses down. We're, you're not going to be able to look at all of them. There's third John 6 and 1 Peter... 1, 4 through 5. Now remember, even though they're dealing with primarily Jewish, they have some spiritual Christian too, right? That's important. So you're going to see some Christian things involved. All right, look at Acts chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11. The Bible says, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So notice that the Apostle said that there is no difference and that it's by faith we are saved. Not works, because verse 10, Now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You see that? So, they're saying right here, it's not going to be works that we're saved, but by faith. Verse 11, an important verse, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. You see, so they believe that it's by salvation by faith without works. And who is that? Who said that? This is going to be powerful who said that. We're going to look at verse, Acts chapter 15, and we're going to look at verse 23 through 24. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The who? Apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles. Verse 24. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. So the apostles are saying there are certain among our group that are trying to sub subvert your soul, trying to tell you that salvation is what? Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave what? No such commandment. That's right. 
That's a powerful verse. So this verse is saying James, John, the apostles, and Peter, they all said salvation is by faith without works, and it is not by works. They said that. And they said, we, they said this is what we stand and believe. And those of us who come out from us and teach you that there is works, they're out, they said. Amen. So, this is going to be very powerful. So, when people try to pull up these passages on you, James, Peter, John, and all that kind of stuff, don't let that scare you. Because the apostles believed that salvation was faith alone without works. But, when it concerns end times Jewish things, you see, end times Jewish things, see, dividing it, it's what? They believe faith and works. But that's for end times, right. Jewish things. You see that? All right. You're going to also notice that in these verses, <clears throat> they have many spiritual Christian doctrines. We're going to look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. This is a verse that we Christians can certainly use. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 38. Acts chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 36 through 38. The Bible says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Notice right here that in this verse, this eunuch that Philip baptized is saved like us. Because Philip said, you believe on Jesus Christ for your salvation first. So this is an apostle teaching Christian doctrine. You see? Let's also look at 3 John 6. 3 John 6. Notice that the apostle John, he even mentioned stuff that would apply to the spiritual Christian church. The book of 3 John, and we're going to look at verse 6. The Bible says, Which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. So notice right here, John is talking about, see, the spiritual Christian church here. So you're going to see Christian doctrines in here. Let's also look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter is especially strong in spiritual Christian doctrine. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. You see. The Bible says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So notice the Bible says, There is something up in heaven reserved for you, and it will never fade away. So this verse is saying you can't lose heaven. It will be reserved. By what? Faith. Look at verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see? So it's only by faith that you are reserved. That's spiritual Christian doctrine, you see? Amen. So the people, you see the confusion that people will go to. All right? They're, they get confused they're going to go, I don't get it. There's spiritual Christian doctrine. There's end time Jewish doctrine. Why is there a mingling of that in, in their books? I don't get it. So when you look at Acts, when you look at James, when you look at 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and even Revelation, it's not just only Jews or only Christians. It's not like that. All right? It's not like John is going to say, this is for only Jews in the tribulation. Nothing for Christian. Peter's not going to say that. In, and they're not going to even say, John's not going to say, this is only for spiritual Christian church. Neither is Peter going to say that. Well, why? That would be a lot simpler. Yeah, it would. Well, it would be a lot more simpler, and we wouldn't end up with all this wrong doctrine. You know why they did that? It's very understandable. Remember? Because what? The, they were taught under Jesus. That's right. That was their teaching. What were they trained by Jesus? Primarily a Jewish ministry that talked about end time events while introducing some spiritual Christian doctrine. You see? 
That's their knowledge. That's why they wrote like this. You see that? That's why it's so important to see which one is end times Jewish, which one is spiritual Christian. You have to divide it. When you read Acts, James, and Revelation, you can't just clean off one book. Oh, John is for Christians. Uh, Peter is for Jews. And then James is for Jews. You can't do that. What you have to do is when you read that book, you have to take the verse and see which one can be end time Jewish, which one sounds like spiritual Christian. You have to do that. You might say, well, that's pretty difficult, Pastor. How am I supposed to know? How you can know it is this person right here. That's why this person is important. Right. He wrote the passages that apply to, <coughs> to spiritual Christian church. When you see any of these writings here, this is good advice. See, when you see any of these writings here that contradict this guy's writings, then you know that applies to a different group of people, Amen. different time, Amen. you see. Right. So this is how you read the Bible. This is very simple. When you read the Bible, any newcomer does this too, right? When a newcomer reads the Bible, he just reads it and applies to himself, right? But when he reads something that goes, that don't sound Christian, then what do you do with that? You compare that with this man's writing, Paul, and then you go, okay, so, since it contradicts this guy's writing, then the verse that I'm reading must not apply to me. Amen. It must apply to something else. Yeah. And then, look at it, okay? Okay, so if you're right here confused and you go, okay, what is it then? Oh, it's under conscience. This is for Noah or Abraham. You get confused uh, right here when reading Matthew to John. Oh, I'm confused. Uh, and it contradicts this guy's writing. Okay, who is it at? Ah, during the first coming under Jesus' ministry, you see? And etc. with all the others. You see that? Especially this. Especially this, okay? This is especially it, okay? Okay, this guy's writing, on this verse, conflicts this Paul guy's writing, Paul. Oh, then who's it applied to? Oh, I remember. End time Jewish. That was their ministry. So it's going to be end time Jewish, you see? Oh, but I see a verse here that can match with the, Paul's writing. So this is spiritual Christian. You see? So you have to look at this man's writing. This man is a very important figure. And that's why he's the most despised among Old Testament Judaism and many cults. Because this is the foundation of Christian doctrine. Alright, let's look at this individual, okay? Let's look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. So why is it that Paul, he was... His was a little bit more clear, spiritual Christian doctrine. Why was his more clear? You know why? Because he, his ministry was primarily non-Jews. You see that? So it's not tied to a lot of this Jewish thing. You see, physical dealings. It's not tied to that. It's mostly non-Jews. What's not Jewish? So right here. See? Non-Jewish people. Spiritual church so, there's a lot of spiritual dealings in his writings. Look at Romans chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 13. For I speak to you who? Who is Paul speaking to? Jews? No, for I speak to you Gentiles. See that? Non-Jews. So, that's why his writing is different. You see, it's not Jewish. It's non-Jewish. That's why it makes sense his writing is different. Let's also look at Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Romans chapter 16. He also says that his teachings, this is important now, Paul was not like the apostles sitting under Jesus' ministry. That was primarily Jewish and end time. His was by himself, directly from God. A revelation that was not given in any other time period, you see? It was a revelation that was not given clearly as all these other time periods. So this is something brand new, you see? Look at Romans 16. We're going to look at verse 25. The Bible says, <coughs> Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. You see that? Paul said this revelation from God was secret from all other time periods, but it was clearly given to me. Verse 26, But now is made manifest. So Paul's saying now it's showing. Now is made manifest 
and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of what? Faith, you see. So Paul saying that his gospel, that his preaching and teaching is something that was not clearly seen before, you see. It's new. So this is what's going to be expected. Let's look at Romans chapter 11, verse 6. Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. Once you have Romans 11 and verse 6, we're also going to look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, and we will look at verse 30. So notice that Paul's teaching is going to be different from Jewish teachings from before. Now remember the Jewish teachings that, it's, that it said that it was faith and works for salvation? Faith and works? He's going to say it's only faith, not a single work involved, even when you still sin. That's what he says. Even when you still sin... It's still saved by faith without a single word. Now that sounds very different from these guys back then, right? Because when they committed certain sins, they were worried about if they're really saved or not, right? But Paul said it very differently. He says, even if you sin and you feel like you're not saved or not, you're still saved. Very different. Why is it different, Pastor? Because remember, he's dealing with non-Jews. Remember, his teaching is something new given by God that was not clearly seen before. You see? So look at Romans chapter 11, verse 6. This is a powerful verse, all right? And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be a works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. That's a powerful verse. This verse says if you're saved by grace, then it's going to be only by grace alone. And if, you're, if there's going to be works, it's going to be works. Otherwise, you get rid of the meaning of work and you get rid of the meaning of faith. So, see, this is what Lordship Salvation, uh, Paul Washer, Ray Comfort, all these guys, you know, they teach this. They teach this ridiculous idea. Oh, we are saved by faith. We're not saved by works. We are saved by faith. But repentance is so important. So yeah, if you're, a, if you're carnal, if you're sinning this really bad stuff, then yeah, you're not saved. Well, well, Paul, he says, then you get rid of the meaning of faith. You get rid of the meaning of works, you see. He says, work should be left as work and grace as grace, you see. That's not called salvation by grace. If you fail in your work and you sin, and you're really not saved by grace. That doesn't make sense. Look at Ephesians 4. This verse is powerful. Look at Ephesians 4. This verse says, even when you still sin, you're still saved all the way. You know that? Look at Ephesians 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So, see, you can grieve. You can sin against the Holy Spirit. See, you can sin where it can grieve God. But it says, Whereby ye are what? Sealed unto the day of redemption. See that? You're sealed all the way to the end. So even though you can grieve the Holy Spirit with your sin, you're still sealed all the way. See, so see, even when you're still sinning, you're still saved. That's totally different, isn't it? These people were saying, if you do this sin and that sin, if you don't do this work and that work, you're lost, right? Yeah. Very different, you see. That's why, you see, it makes sense. It makes sense why they had to do this work and it seemed like they weren't really saved and all this kind of stuff. Because you put it at that right time period, the right group of people, you see? Yeah, that's right. You see? That's what dispensation means, remember? Dispensation, giving things and ministering things to different people. All right? This is our people. This is our guy. All right? This is not us. This is not us. This is not us. This, this, not, this is not us. You're looking at the wrong guy, you see. Yeah. Amen. You see? You're looking at the wrong guy, you see. Let's also look at Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, excuse me. We'll look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we will look at verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, and we're going to look at verse 9. Notice right here. Now remember, Paul was given a revelation that was so clear, not given before, right? So only to Paul. So here's something that was very clear that was not taught before. Paul teaches that there is a rapture that is not part of the tribulation wrath. All right, remember, what did Jesus taught? What did Jesus taught before about the rapture? There's going to be a rapture after the tribulation, right? That's what he taught. Amen. But here comes Paul, and he's going to teach that the rapture is not during the tribulation wrath. He's going to say it's outside of that. It's going to be before. Why? Because remember, Jesus was dealing with Jews. Remember, Jewish things, end time events. Paul was what? Paul was something clearly given, revelation that was not given before, you see? So this was not taught by Jesus before, okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we're going to look... Uh, chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 9. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed. So, appointed, right? Like a time, right? God did not set a time for us. Appointed us to what? Wrath. So, God says He's not going to put us in a time period of wrath. Remember? The tribulation is wrath. Remember? The tribulation is wrath. So God says we're not going to be in that appointed time. We're not going to be in the tribulation. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 now. 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 52. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 52. Notice that when Paul talks about the rapture, he says that it is something given to him that was not taught before. All right? So he's arguing for a rapture that is before the tribulation. See? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. And behold, I show you a what? Mystery. You know what mystery means? It means something that was not given before. It was not revealed before. So this is something new, okay? So Jesus didn't teach this, the apostles didn't teach this, etc. Verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. See, that's a rapture, the dead rising. So this is confusing. Paul said, I'm teaching you a rapture that was not revealed clearly before. Whoa, 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 whoa. But didn't Jesus talk about a rapture before at Matthew 24? You know why? Because Jesus was saying this is after the tribulation. That's right. Mm -hmm. Paul, would, Paul never mentioned anything about tribulation in 1 Corinthians 15. Do you see that anywhere? No. So that's what's new, you see. He says, he's showing right here Christians are not going through tribulation. They're going to be out of the tribulation. Amen. Because remember 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God did not appoint us to wrath, you see. Right. So our rapture is not going to be during the tribulation wrath, you see. Amen. That's what's new, you see. That's what's new, you see. Let's also look at Acts chapter 19, uh, Hebrews 1, excuse me, Hebrews 1 and then Hebrews 10. Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 10. And we're going to have to close it right here, actually. We're going to have to close it right here. Hebrews chapter 1. And we're going to look at Hebrews 10. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Through 27. Now, this is very important, okay? Because Paul was ministering to non Jews, you got to realize this. This does not mean that he did not deal with Jews, all right? He did deal with some Jews, 
There's no doubt about it. Paul did minister to some Jews. It was primarily non-Jewish, but he still dealt with some Jews. So you notice right here with Paul, you see with Paul, there's a little bit of white, see? A little bit of what? Physical dealings, Jews, you see? But it's mostly what? Non-Jewish. You see, it's mostly non-Jewish here. So if Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, if he was the author of the book of Hebrews, that's why it makes sense. You'll see end times Jewish teachings. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. The Bible says, Hath in these last days. See that? In these last days. See? So it's referring to what? End times. Uh-oh, highlight, you see. Not only that, look at the title of the book. What is the title of the book? Hebrews. See that? You can't say non-Jews there, you see. <laughs> That's Hebrews, you see. Jews. So if it's end times and Jewish, then what do you think the salvation is going to be, you see? It's going to be faith and works. Look at chapter 10. Look at chapter 10. All right, we're going to look at verses 26 through 27. Chapter 10, verse 26 through 27. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. All right, if we sin even after we heard the truth. All right, so this is a problem. Remember, what did Paul say? Even if you sin after you got saved, you're still saved, right? Amen. But here it sounds like if you sin after you get saved, what? There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Well, that sounds like hell. Amen. You see that? Why? Why, Pastor? Because remember, it's end times Jewish, you see? That's right. That's why, you see? But remember, remember this. Paul ministered a lot to... The, a lot to non-Jews, right? So what's important is that the book of Hebrews, you're going to see a lot of Christian doctrine too. You see that? Because remember, Paul's ministry was based off this, you see? That was, it was primarily based off. So you're not going to be surprised to see some Christian doctrine right here. Really, Pastor? There is? Yeah, because if you look at uh, chapter 9, and then you look and you read chapter 9... Yeah, it's mostly chapter 9. Oh, chapter 10 too. Chapter 10, the first part of chapter 10. You're going to see a lot about New Testament Christian doctrine. You see, you're going to see a lot of New Testament Christian doctrine. We won't have time to read all of that, but you're going to notice that. You're going to notice that. He talks about a lot of New Testament Christian doctrine. So that's the reason why you're going to see some uh, non-Jewish spiritual church Christian doctrines as well. So we've talked about how the Apostle Paul... He, his writings are primarily non-Jewish, right? And so because his writings are primarily non-Jewish, that's where we can get our teachings, our doctrines from. So Paul, he taught non-Jewish doctrine. It was primarily non-Jewish because it was much of it was new revelation from God. New revelation from God. So that's why you notice right here, there, instead of physical Jews and Gentiles, you see... It's now switching from non, uh, Jewish to non-Jewish because it's going to be based on a non-Jewish organism, organism called the church. It's going to be mostly spiritual. However, despite of most of this, there's still a little bit of Jewish here. You notice that? So if Paul, he wrote the book of Hebrews, if he wrote, book, if he wrote the book of Hebrews, then what we do know is that he did teach some Jewish end time doctrine as well. This is apparently shown in the book of Acts as well. Go to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. Acts chapter 19. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. You're going to notice right here that the Holy Ghost baptism was received by physical deeds, you see. It wasn't by faith in Jesus Christ. It was by physical deeds. Why? Because they were dealing with Jews. Remember, Jews are based primarily on physical dealings. Remember that. 
So it's not like Christians based on spiritual dealings. So when they receive the Holy Ghost baptism, it's going to be done by physical laying of hands. And you'll notice that water baptism is also involved. Go to Acts chapter 19. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Look at this, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Now for us Christians, we can say yes. Spiritual Christians say yes. But they said, and they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. You see? So they didn't receive it. Verse 3, And he said unto them, Here's the key. Why didn't they receive it? Verse 3, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said what? Unto John's baptism. Remember John the Baptist? What was his ministry? His ministry was primarily Jewish, right? And how did he get those people saved and all that? He did, remember, water baptism? Why? Because remember, they're dealing with physical Jews. So they have to use physical dealings, physical water baptism, and then physical other things where they can receive the things of God. Now over here, they, they were baptized unto John's baptism. So that's why believing was not enough. That's why notice that in verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Charismatics and Pentecostals, etc., they will use verse 6 to claim, so in order to receive the Holy Ghost, you have to get water baptized. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will get the signs speaking in tongues. Remember, who, were th who was it addressed to? At verse 3, it was speaking to Jews. Jews from John's baptism, you see. When they received the Holy Ghost, it was by what? G physical Jews under physical dealings, right? That's why they had to get physical water baptism. And that's why physical signs, like speaking in tongues, healings and all that, accompany. Why? Because they're physical Jews under physical dealings. Let's look at another one. Romans 15. Romans 15. Romans 15. We're going to look at verses 18 through 19. Romans 15, verses 18 through 19. So remember, since Paul was ministering to some Jews, that's why he was able to do signs and wonders. Spiritual Christians, we don't have signs and wonders, but because there were physical Jews still going on, that's why they had physical signs and wonders still. Look at Romans chapter 15. We're going to look at verse 18 through 19. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ, Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders. So notice that Paul was able to do physical miracles literal, physical, miracles, signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. Notice, so that from Jerusalem, see, because the origin is Jewish, that's not a surprise, and round about unto Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So the reason why Paul was able to have his signs and wonders going with Gentiles, some non-Jews, is because he was still ministering to Jews, you see. He was still ministering to Jews. And remember, Paul is a Jew, you see. He's not a non-Jew, he's a Jew. That's why he's still able to do physical signs and wonders, you see. So, what is important to know about the Apostle Paul, that's why there was a transition, but it's mostly spiritual Christian, right? It's mostly spiritual Christian. And just a little bit of physical Jew, because they're about to be done, alright? Now, remember, why was there a transition again between physical Jewish and spiritual Christian? Why was there this transition? Because remember, Jesus Christ told them, He warned them, See, it was primarily Jewish, right? But he warned them, if you reject it, I'm going to switch to non-Jews. 
And see, more and more, it was non-Jew, 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 and now it's like completely non-Jew. Jews are not there. That's why right here, notice that for Christians, there is no physical Jew. It's all non-Jewish. So let's look at these verses. We're going to look at Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. Romans chapter 11 and verses 25 through 26. Romans chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 25 through 26. Notice that the physical nation of Israel, physical Jews, are done. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. You see that? Israel is done in part. Until when? When will God use Israel again? Look at verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. See, it's sometime in the future. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So it's when God, Zion the Deliverer, actually comes for Israel. So it's sometime in the future, you see. So that's why Israel is done, but only temporarily, you see. So when we talk about spiritual Jews and spiritual Israel, that's us Christians, you see, because physical Israel is done, but only temporarily, only for here, you see, only for Christians. But remember, God gave a promise to Abraham long, long time ago, right? He says that physical Israel will never be broken, right? So, that means he has to use physical Israel again, you see. And we're going to find that out later. So, because there's nothing Jewish going on here, that's why we don't believe in physical signs. You see that? Tongue, physical signs, physical tongues, physical healings. Because they belong to who, church? The physical Jews. Holy Ghost baptism. How do they receive it? By physical deeds, right? Laying on of hands and sometimes water baptism was involved. That was what? Physical Jews, right? That's why we don't do this anymore, you see? What about all these other things about end time Jewish things? What about water baptism and works of repentance, which is for physical Jews? What about that one? It's not here anymore because God is done with physical Jews, you see. It's completely spiritual Christian. That's why we don't believe in signs and wonders today. That's why we don't believe in physical water baptism today. That's why we don't believe in physical laying of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. That's why we do not believe in physical works involved for salvation. That's the reason why we do not believe in a physical kingdom on earth today, you see. Because all of that is what? Jews, Jews, Jews. You see that? And God is done with the Jews here. That's why we don't do this anymore, you see? But during Paul's time, they were still dealing with Jews, right? During the Apostles' time, they were dealing with Jews. Especially under Jesus' ministry, primarily Jews, right? That's why they had physical signs. That's why physical works were involved for salvation relating to end times. That's why the physical kingdom of heaven was preached during that time. That's why physical water baptism was involved for salvation. That's why physical laying of hands to receive the Holy Ghost was involved. You see that? Amen. But none of that is for today because what? This is the key. See, Israel, Jew, is the key word, you see. It's done, Amen. you see. It's done. So, what does that mean then? Then that means our teachings, uh, God's dealings for us, is it going to be physical or spiritual? It's going to be spiritual, right? Amen. So, notice right here that the foundation for us then is the spiritual church. You see that? Not physical. Okay? It's spiritual. That's the foundation. Whatever physical is going to have to be based on this foundation, you see. But back then, what was the foundation? Physical, right? right amen. That was the foundation. That's why they had to have physical water baptism, physical signs and wonders, physical nation of Israel, physical kingdom of heaven and all that, you see? So here's the key now. Since we're based now on spiritual dealings, then what is the teachings 
our foundation is going to be based upon? Spiritual, right? Amen. Not physical. Right. So whatever spiritual teaching was taught, that's where we get our doctrine from, right. you see? Uh, well, pastor, how do we know which books of the Bible, which verses apply to us? This is a key. Remember, Paul, he was ministering primarily to non-Jews, right? So we're going to have to look at his writings. Okay, which of his writings were non-Jewish? It's right here, Romans to Philemon, all right? If you look at every, look at the, all the first ten verses or the first five verses of Romans to Philemon. It's introduced to non-Jewish people, see? Non-Jewish people. And it mentions the church, the church, the Christian church, the Christian church. So we do know that this will apply to us then, you see? Because this is not Jewish, you see? And not only that, here's another important verse. Another thing to remember is that God had spiritual dealings going on over here too, right? Remember? God had spiritual dealings going on over here. Like, for example, uh, Abraham, what we saw, what we remember, what we noticed about Abraham is that he had faith, not works, right? When he believed in the stars. There was one spiritual thing. Another spiritual thing we remember was that the works of the law were imperfect, right? Another spiritual thing was that during Matthew, in the books of Matthew to John, Jesus Christ was introducing spiritual doctrines and salvation by faith, right? Another thing right here, spiritual kingdom of God, that was preached during Matthew to John, right? The apostles' writings right here, remember they, had, they taught some spiritual Christian things too, right? So whatever, so you notice right here, whatever verse here that matches with Romans to Philemon, you see that? So whatever doctrine and verse here that matches with Romans to Philemon, it's going to be a spiritual Christian doctrine, you see? So that's what's very important. That's why Paul, it makes sense, why Paul, in order to prove his spiritual Christian doctrine, he didn't have the New Testament, right? He only had Old Testament. Yeah. So what did he have to do? He had to find every spiritual dealing in the Old Testament. You see that? He had to find every spiritual dealing in the Old Testament. So then he uses these spiritual teachings in the Old Testament and puts it to Romans to Philemon because that fits perfectly for non-Jews who are not based on physical but spiritual. You see that? Yeah, right. But Jews are all based on physical. Amen. You see? Jews are all based on physical. So, one thing is this, is that the law and water baptism and signs and receiving the Holy Ghost baptism by physical deeds, they're all gone, you see. That's because those are all Jewish, all right? We're going to look one by one at the verses. Let's look at the law. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Colossians 2, verse 14. That's why Paul said that we don't go by the law for our salvation. You see that? Because it's no longer physical Jewish. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 14. Colossians 2, verse 14. The Bible says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that's the law, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of unholy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. So notice right here the Jewish physical diets, the Jewish physical rules in their law of Moses, the Jewish days of observance that are physical based on the physical law we don't base that anymore you see that's why it's gone you see that's why it's gone because why because physical dealings jewish is not there anymore all right let's look at another passage we're going to look at first corinthians 1 17 first corinthians 1 17 first corinthians chapter 1 and we're going to look at verse 17 Notice that water baptism is no longer required for salvation. Water baptism is no longer required for salvation. 
Notice, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. See that? So Paul's saying that the gospel of salvation is not in part with water baptism. You see that? Why? Because we're based on spiritual now. See? Faith. Believing in Christ. See? Faith. Spiritual. Not physical, like water baptism or the law of Moses. Here's another one. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Notice how we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Spiritual, not physical. We don't need the laying of hands. We don't need to speak in tongues. We don't need to get baptized in water. We don't need those physical things. Physical things for physical Jews, you see? We're all based on spiritual, just faith in Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. You see that? Notice we are baptized by the Spirit into one body, the body of Jesus. Okay? Okay, how do you get baptized by the Spirit into the body of Jesus? Look at Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. Okay, how do you get baptized by the Spirit into the body of Jesus? It's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Gospel. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Notice in the body. Okay, remember that Paul said you are spiritually baptized into one body. Okay, so you're in the body how? And partakers of His promise based on what? In Christ by the gospel. You see that? It's not based on... This verse did not say getting into the body by water baptism. Getting into the body by speaking in tongues. Getting into the body by laying of hands. No, it says getting into the body by what? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just by faith, you see? You see? So when 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is said, you are baptized into one body. Okay, how do you get baptized by the Spirit into the body? Ephesians 3 says, by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's not, or, you know, someone, oh, breathe on me and touch me. And, you know, soak me in water with the squirt gun. You know, see, nothing physical, you see. Amen. Physical goes to here. See, Jews, we're all based on spiritual. You see that? So what's important is this, is that if, we're, if we follow the law and water baptism, then what it's going to be based upon is that it's going to be based upon spiritual dealings, because that's the foundation, you see? That's the foundation. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 21. So we do practice water baptism. We do practice water baptism, but that is based on spiritual dealings, okay? What's, this, what's the spiritual aspect, Pastor, that we observe water baptism? By conscience, see? Having a good conscience, you see? Good conscience. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The Bible says, The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us. On what? Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. You see, that has nothing to do with washing away your sins. But notice the answer of a good conscience toward God. You see? So we practice water baptism not to earn salvation by physical works like Jews. It's for the spiritual aspect of having a good conscience. Because why? Christians are based on spiritual dealings, remember. So that's the problem with hyper-dispensationalists, right? Hyper-dispensationalists, they reject water baptism completely. They do not believe in water baptism because they say, oh, that's Jewish, you know. Hey, man, you, they, uh, they ignored the spiritual dealings of God, right? The spiritual dealings of God. There are spiritual dealings going on. Water baptism has a spiritual aspect, and that is to have a good conscience toward God, you see. Let's look at another passage, Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 14. 
Notice that we follow the law only when it relates to our spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. Okay? Only when it's based on our spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. So we don't do uh, observe the Sabbath and diets and all those physical things. We only observe the law when it concerns spiritual things. In what way, Pastor? Look at this, Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. So how do you fulfill the law? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see that? Spiritual. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See that? So you have, it's based on your spiritual walk with Jesus that you will keep the law of Moses. Yeah. So not like, you know, observe the Sabbath day, but something like, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness. See, something that relates to our spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Not only that, look at verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, notice, ye are not under the law. Amen. You see that? So it's by just following the Holy Spirit within your spiritual walk, not fleshy things, you see, then automatically you're doing, you're just following the law and you don't have to observe all these physical things that the law says. You see that? So that's where we observe the Mosaic Law, you see? So we're not hyper-dispensationalists and just chop off the whole law, you see? Aren't there important things in the law you should learn for your spiritual walk? Yes, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. There's even a passage there that talks about uh, that you should be against homosexuality and prostitution. Yep. <laughs> you see? Amen. So we're not going to chop this off, okay? Don't be a hyper-dispensationalist, you see. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. So for Christians today, let me ask you this. For us Christians today, what is your final authority of all your beliefs? Is it physical signs and wonders for your evidence? No. no. Is it uh, by water baptism? No. Is it Jesus literally here on earth like he was right over here? No. no. It's not by doing physical works of action, right? right. What is our evidence? The Bible. Amen. Amen. So you see, that's where all of our doctrine is from, is on the Bible. Why? Because the Bible is the spiritual words of God, that's you right. see? So that's where all of our beliefs lie upon. Not signs and tongues and healings. That's physical for physical Jews, you see? Look at Ephesians 1.3. This is an important aspect. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. How did God bless us Christians today? With what? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. Can't you get a spiritual blessing in Genesis, Job, Exodus to Malachi, Matthew to John, Acts, James through Revelation, and Hebrews? Can you get spiritual blessings out of those? Yes. yes. So you shouldn't chop those out. And you should take whatever spiritual blessing and apply it to yourself, you see? But whatever that's a physical dealing, you see, that's for end time Jewish, we know that's out then, you see? That's out. So that's what's wrong with hyper-dispensationalists. See, they only look at Romans to Philemon, Romans to Philemon, Romans to Philemon. Everything Jewish there, everything Jewish there, chop them out. You can't do that. There are spiritual blessings you can find there, spiritual dealings of God, spiritual applications, you see. Now let's look at these elements, okay? So this is what's vitally important, okay? So... Faith not works even when sinning, right? We looked at Ephesians 4.30, right? Paul wrote that to non-Jews, right? So that applies to us, yes? So that's us. Because why? It's spiritual faith. Nothing physical works. Here's another one. Is that we believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, right? Why? Because this was written, remember, to non-Jews, right? We looked at that. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, right? We do not believe in post-tribulation rapture, right? Why? Because post-tribulation rapture was for who? End times Jewish, remember? It was end times Jewish. So that's not us. That's for them. This is us over here. 
So this is our beliefs, you see. So any other religion out there or any other preacher out there who teaches against a pre-tribulation rapture, who teaches that there should be good works involved even after you believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, who teaches that you receive the Holy Ghost baptism by laying of hands, who believes that you have to speak in tongues and have miracles, who believe in water baptism for salvation, who believe you have to keep the law like Seventh-day Adventists, then what are they? They are heretics. Amen. Because why? Because this is us. We do not believe in those things. This is us, see? This is our doctrine. If they teach law for salvation, then where are you going to find that from? All the way here at a different time period to a different group of people. When they talk about water baptism for salvation, where do they get that from? From a different time period under a different group of people, you see. If they talk about a Holy Ghost baptism by laying of hands, where are they going to get that from? From a different time period to a different group of people, you see. When they talk about signs and wonders and all that, where do they get that from? From a different time period, different group of people, you see. I guarantee you this. Every false doctrine that they use, okay, it's going to be based on 90% of the time to a Jew involved. And then 99% of the time, or 100% of the time, to a Jew and a different time period. See? That's why this doctrine is so important, you see? That's why we believe in these doctrines, you see? So this is why we avoid hyper-dispensationalism. They're also known as mid acts and Grace Church. Avoid these people. Why? Because these people, they ignore the spiritual dealings, spiritual Christian doctrines that you can find in here. You see? That you can find in here. So you should reject these guys. They're heretics. Because can you get spiritual blessings out of the books of the Bible here? Yes, you can. All right. So these guys, out. People who teach water baptism for salvation. And that's the Roman Catholic Church. That's the Church of Christ. And that's the Mormon Church. Uh, some Pentecostals. They are out. Alright? People who teach salvation has been the same from beginning to end. That there was... Uh, that there was... Uh, not one... That there was one salvation plan from beginning to end. They're out. That's covenant theology, covenant of grace. And that's primarily Calvinist, Presbyterian churches, James White, and including independent fundamental Baptist churches such as Shelton Smith and Sword of the Lord, Jack Hiles and his Hiles churches, and West Coast Baptist College under Paul Chapel, and many other independent fundamentalist Baptist churches. And I guarantee you all independent fundamentalist Baptist churches in this city, in this area, I guarantee you. Amen. Teach this heresy. They're out. Why? Because we've seen that salvation plans were very very different, right? Amen. We've seen that all over. People who teach that Christians have to be raptured after the tribulation, heretics. They're out. That's for what? End times Jewish, right? We saw that before. You listen to Stephen Anderson's teaching. Texi Mars converted to this issue. Ken Hovind converted to this issue. Rasmussen teaches this. And Catholic Church and a lot of cults believe in this doctrine too, actually. And what they are? Out. Heretics. Lordship salvation. In other words, when you repent to get saved, it's not just believing in Jesus Christ. After you believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, you cannot be a carnal Christian. Oh, that's just nonsense. P people, there are still carnal saved Christians. Amen? There still are. So, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, Ray Comfort, and many other Christians. There's a YouTube channel called Wretched. <laughs> I guess they are wretched. Don't listen to them, okay? And all these other popular guys, James White teaches this too. Out! All right, Because, remember, Christians are faith not works even when still sinning, right? That's us. Where they get their doctrine of repentance concerning that Christians, after they get saved by faith alone, they, uh, they, won't, they cannot be carnal. It's impossible. Where do they get those verses from? From some, see, different time periods or a Jew involved. You see, again, who teach works for salvation? Every single religion except Baptist denominations. Who teaches works? Catholics, Masons, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Scientology, Church of Christ, 
all that out. They're heretics, see? Because faith not works even when still sinning. People who teach you can lose your salvation. See, after I'm saved by faith, I can lose my salvation because I committed some really bad sin in the future. They're heretics because faith not works even when still sinning. They get their verses from some other time period or a Jew involved. You see, again, they will get their verses out of there. People who teach signs, right? Charismatics, Pentecostals, Catholics even believe in it too. Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, and all these famous Trinity Broadcasting Network preachers, Bishop T.D. Jakes, John Haggy, those guys, heretics out. Because, why? Because Christians are under spiritual dealings by faith in the Word of God, that's our evidence, not signs and wonders, because signs and wonders are physical, and therefore who? Physical Jews, again. People who teach, oh, you got to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost by speaking in tongues, by laying of hands, blah, blah, blah. It's not just believing in Jesus. You have to speak in tongues and you have to get the laying of hands. You have to have Benny Hinn blow his bad breath on you so you can feel the Holy Ghost out. You know why? Because those physical deeds, physical actions, laying of hands, water baptism, speaking in tongues to get the Holy Ghost, is again under a different time period or under a different group of people. That's you right. see that? Amen. Not us. We're based on spiritual dealings again, you see? And it's all the spiritual dealing faith to get the Holy Ghost, you see? People who teach replacement theology, they're out. They believe that the church is a replacement of Israel. Out. We learn that what? We replace Israel temporarily, right? right? That's what we learn. Physical Israel will be dealt with again because God promised Abraham, remember. God promised Abraham, physical Israel, he will never break. It's everlasting. Heretics, out. Calvinism believes in this, all right? Stephen Anderson believes in this. Texie Mars believe in this. And a lot of other cults believe in it. Out. Sabbath and law observance. Seventh-day Adventists, right? They believe you have to keep the law. There are some Jews who become Christians. They think you have to keep all these things. You have to do that. No, they're out. All right? Because why? Because we're based, again, on spiritual dealings, not physical things. Amen. Physical things, again, who's it going to be? Under a different time period or with a Jew involved? Okay, out. Old Testament Judaism, where they, they, they do not believe in Jesus Christ as a suffering Messiah and faith alone in Christ for salvation without works? Out. Why? Because remember that in the Old Testament, the Lord, the Bible prophesied that the Messiah Messiah is going to come not just king, but suffer too. You see, they ignore that part. That's why we believe in the first and second coming. Jesus coming as king and suffer. See, they're only looking at this. They're not going to look at this, you see. So these guys, out. Also, they ignored some of the spiritual dealings of God in the Old Testament, right? Because Paul used those verses. We also saw some of those verses too, right? We saw some of those verses where there are spiritual dealings of God in the Old Testament that Paul used. Out! Prosperity gospel where you just serve God and you'll get physically rich and get physical money and all that. Out! Joel Osteen teaches this. Rick Warren teaches this. High Bills teaches this. All those mega churches teaches this. Bishop D.D. Jakes. All those guys. Out! Charismatic out, new evangelical churches out, non-denominational churches out. Because why? Because this is under, again, with the Jew involved, under a different time That's period. Right. You see? Yeah. Out. Now, do you see why most likely anyone who's watching online or the 99% uh, of the people out there will be attending a wrong church? Amen. You see why this doctrine is so important? Pastor, why did you have to go through all this stuff? All this stuff. You know why we had to go through all this stuff? Because to make you see, those teachings were under a different time period with, with God's physical dealing with the physical Jew involved. That's right. That's where all your false doctrines come from, you see. And that's why we don't follow those things. We follow what? Only... Spiritual Christian doctrines, you see? Why? Because this is, this, is, this is where we get it. See, Romans to Philemon. Romans to Philemon and matching verses. See, Romans to Philemon and whatever verse that matches. This is our foundation. Because why? This is addressed to non-Jews, and it was addressing about the spiritual dealings of God. You see that? Yeah. Not physical dealings with Israel. You see? So, when we review these books of the Bible... Genesis 1 through 3, all right? 
you're going to see different time period under Adam. So don't get your doctrines out of here. All right? Unless it matches with Romans to Philemon. Genesis 4 through 50 and the book of Job. Don't get your doctrines here. All right? It's different time period under different group of people. All right? Only find the verses that matches with, with Romans to Philemon. All right? Same thing with the law. Exodus to Malachi. Don't get your doctrines over there. All right? Get it to Romans to Philemon. All right? Whatever verse in here that matches with Romans to Philemon is a spiritual dealing of God that you can apply to yourself. People who use Matthew to John. All right? Don't listen to them. Their doctrines are off. Go to Romans to Philemon. Unless the verses here, again, unless what? The verses are spiritual dealings that matches with Romans to Philemon. Same thing here. Acts to James to Revelation. Whatever verse they use over here against your Christian doctrine, ignore it. Don't get your doctrine over there. Unless it matches, the verse is a spiritual Christian verse that matches with Romans to Philemon. Amen. Acts Hebrews. Don't get your doctrine here. Out. Okay? Unless, again, unless if the verse is a spiritual Christian doctrine that matches with Romans to Philemon. Okay? So, if a heretic pulls up Acts 2.38 to you, should you get worried about that? No. Out. Different time period, different group of people. Amen. Does not match with Romans to Philemon. Out. Right. If someone pulls up signs and wonders that the apostles did at the book of Acts, they'll pull up Acts 14, Acts 15, Acts 16, Acts 21, etc., etc. Should you get scared about that and believe it? No. Out. Because remember, if it contradicts with Romans Philemon, out. Okay? Out. All right. If people go to Matthew chapter 3, all right, repent and be baptized and do the works of repentance. Uh, to receive the Holy uh, to get the gifts of the Holy Spirit compared with Acts 2.38 and they mention all this stuff out, out, out okay, Matthew to John out, okay Exodus to Malachi out Genesis 4.50 to Job out Genesis 1-3 to out, alright out, out, and out if it doesn't match with the Romans Philemon out, out, and out got that? that's why we went through all this so if a person pulls up Matthew 24, you get raptured after the tribulation. Out, 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 and out. You see, it contradicts Romans to Philemon. That's you right. see? Yeah. See, this is, a st this is us. See? Who is this? Christians. This is us. Amen. See? In this right time period. We're not, we're not, we're not here, 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 and we're none, none of these people. You see? That's right. That's why dispensationalism is important. Amen. That's why you have to go through all this. If you, if you don't remember all this, and I highly recommend going through, starting from beginning again the video, and go through everything again. That way you can understand that those false teachings and doctrines you've learned about faith and works for salvation, water baptism for salvation, speaking in tongues and having healing signs, and then getting the Holy Spirit by laying of hands and somebody blowing His bad breath on you, and then you're doing the works of repentance, all that kind of stuff and post-tribulation rapture and all that kind of stuff. I went through all that to show to you that it was under God's physical dealings Amen. with a physical right. Jew involved, you see. But I also showed you another important thing. God's spiritual dealings too, right? And that's why Old Testament Judaism and hyper-dispensationalism, out. Because there are some spiritual Christian doctrines that you can find in these books of the Bible. Well, how do I know they're a spiritual Christian? Again, Romans to Philemon. See if it matches. So Romans and to Philemon and matching verses. If it matches with Romans to Philemon, it's a spiritual Christian verse, you see. That's right. That's why Paul used these books of the Bible. See, Paul had to use these books of the Bible. He wasn't lying. It wasn't toward just only physical Jews. He knew it could apply to spiritual Christian. Amen. All right. See, that was the most important point. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about the rest, all right? So, second coming. There's not much to know about, actually. All right? So, what you need to know about the tribulation is what? All right? Where do you get your doctrine about the tribulation? Well, the book of Revelation, obviously. But not only that, verses that talk about end times. All right? Now, didn't we go through... The verses that talked about end times Jewish? Yep. Matthew to John. You're going to find it. Uh, you're going to find it at James through, uh, James through Revelation too. You're going to see that too. See? Because the apostles, they uh, learned end times Jewish ministry, right? End times Jewish things. So the general epistles from James to Revelation, Matthew to John. You can find a lot of end time verses. You see? 
Also in the Old Testament, when it talks about latter days or end times, then you know that it's latter days, end time, you see? So there's the answer right there. So let me ask you this then. Okay, what do we know about the tribulation from what we study so far? Well, there's a post-tribulation rapture, right? Post-tribulation rapture. A rapture after the tribulation. Why? Because what happens? The church, remember, is raptured before the tribulation, right? Amen. So notice right here what happened to the church. They're gone. See? Nothing that's... See right here? Nothing that's spiritual Christian. You see that? That's right. This is all what? Physical. That's right. Absolutely. Physical what? See? He's dealing with physical people again. So guess what? The Jews are going to come back. See? The Jews are going to come back. That's right. So, the physical nation of Israel returns. Post-tribulation rapture, physical Israel returns. Also, faith and works for salvation, right? Why? Because, again, physical dealings, again, okay? Faith and works. Alright, several verses that will prove this, okay? We won't... Turn over there for time's sake, but Revelation chapter 14 shows a rapture after the tribulation. Revelation chapter 7 shows 12 tribes of Israel mentioned. God is using them again. Revelation chapter uh, 12 and 14, it mentions here, these are they that uh, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. So faith and works involved, you see. And look, during the tribulation, you have to not take the mark of the beast, right? So isn't that a work? Yeah, that is definitely a work, you see. And then what happens here at the millennium? Well, at the millennium, what do we know about the millennium? Well, the millennium, we, we know the kingdom, right? God promised the kingdom. Oh, remember all the kingdom passages? Where are you going to find it? Okay, remember Jesus talked about it, right? He talked about kingdom of heaven physical, right? So finally, they get their physical kingdom back. And we looked at the verses, right? Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount right. about the physical kingdom. So that's what's going to happen at the kingdom age, you see? What about right here? The prophecy of Messiah as king finally happens. That happens at the kingdom age. You see that? Amen. Another thing is this, is that it is going to be completely works for salvation, no faith. It's going to be works for salvation, no faith. How do you know that, Pastor? Because in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is believing without seeing, right? But at the kingdom, won't they see Jesus? You see that? They're going to see Jesus. So because they see Jesus, that's why faith is not necessary. You see that? Faith is not necessary. But why is works involved? Because you're living with a holy God under a holy kingdom. So the things that you have to do are, are going to have to be holy things, obviously, right? right? You see that? So if you're born under this period when Jesus comes and rules on His physical kingdom, then what you have to do is do holy things. You see that? So that's works for salvation. The verse to show it is Isaiah 33, verse 14 through 15. Isaiah 33, verses 14 through 15. This will be our last passage, and then we're going to close. Quite a ride, quite a journey. This is such an incredible book, you see. You see also why the importance of this doctrine, see? Without this doctrine, it's no wonder that every single church out there almost is teaching heresy. And that by believers are so scarce. That's right. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14 through 15. The Bible says, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Why are they afraid? Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Okay, so who will survive this everlasting hell? Who's going to survive? Verse 15, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, 
You see that? Verse 15. How do you escape the hell fire? It's by doing good works. Right. Well, how do you know that this is talking about Jesus Christ at the kingdom? Because look at verse 17. Thine eyes shall what? See the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. You see? The king has come. You see? Yeah. Millennium, 1,000 years. So thus we finish the teaching of dispensationalism. That's why you see why it's so important in order to study the Bible. How do you study the Bible? Come on, God told you a long time ago. Study to show thyself approved unto God. How? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, it's by proper division. See? Proper division. If you don't do that, it's no wonder. See, let me ask you this one question. If we didn't have these dividing lines, what's going to happen? You're going to combine everything together. Yeah. And that's why people don't get the verses that they're reading, right? This says water baptism for salvation. This one doesn't say water baptism for salvation. Uh, we keep the law of Moses. Oh, we don't keep the law of Moses. Okay, we do signs and wonders. Uh, we don't do signs and wonders anymore. Oh, okay, uh, this and that and that. You go crazy and then you shoot your brains out. And no wonder people think that Christianity is a joke and Bible is full of contradictions. You know why? Because you try to, you try to, don't, you know what heretics do? When you show them these verses, they don't leave the verses as it say, and they try to smooth it out by reinterpreting the verse. Oh, that's not what it really says. Yes. Because they know that without these dividing lines, it's all going to combine together with contradictions and problems, so they have no choice but to put their own interpretation Amen. in the verse. Amen. And when you see that online, you see, that I want you to look... Here's good advice for you. Don't listen to me. I'm telling you to do it yourself. Yeah. When that person quotes the verse and teaches his doctrine, look at what the verse says. That's right. Look at exactly what it says. And if it matches word for word for what he says, then believe him. Right. If it doesn't match word for word what he says, don't believe him. I went word for word what they said. If it said faith and works, I'm not going to correct it. I'm going to say faith and works for salvation. If it said faith not works for salvation, I'm going to say that. Faith not works for salvation. If it says water baptism for salvation, I'm going to say that. If it doesn't say water baptism for salvation, I say that too. See, all those verses, I left it alone, didn't I? Even if it contradicted each other, I left it alone, didn't I? Yeah. Because why? God's word should never be corrected by your mouth. You should be left alone as it is. Yeah, that's right. Well, how do you solve the contradiction? Easy. Divine. Amen. Let me give you one common sense example, okay? If I told my brother, all right, you go wash the dishes, all right? And then I had a sister and I say, you don't wash the dishes. Is that, is, oh, are we going to say, oh, there's a contradiction here. There's a contradiction here. Do I wash the dishes? Do I not wash the dishes? Come on, what's common sense? He told, he, you divided it. The brother washes the dishes. The sister doesn't. You see that? That's right. Let me give you another common sense example. Let me give you another common sense example, okay? Throughout history, okay? Back at Greece, all right? They said, punish by law, all right, for stealing death, Okay? But then all of a sudden, today at Greece, the law is, no, you don't get punished by death for stealing. You get jailed. Is there a contradiction there? Uh, no, you just put one at the right time period. Ancient Greece said that the punishment for stealing was death. Current Greece today didn't say that. That's right. See, that's common sense. This is not made up fantasy. This is just common sense. If you put it at the right person and right time period, you get everything solved. You get everything solved, right. you see? That's just common sense in the Bible. Let me give you one last verse, okay? On. Let me give you one last verse. Isaiah 14, where Satan said, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Am I going to claim that verse as, that applies to me? No, that was for Satan, right? right. Why? Because who's the one speaking it? Yeah. Uh, Satan, not me. That's you right. see? See? Amen. If you find the verse, that completely contradicts and differs from you. See? We know this is us, right? Amen. Non-Jews, spiritual Christian church. It says church in all of their first verses too. That's me, right? If I find a verse here, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. If I see Matthew 24, after the tribulation you get raptured. If I see James 2, where it says you have to do faith and works for salvation. 
What do I do with that? I just know, oh, that doesn't apply to me. That completely contradicts me. That's right. Just like Isaiah 14, where Satan said, I will be like the Most High. I know that completely contradicts me, so that's not me. That's right. All right? It's common basic rule, yeah. dispensationalism. Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bio Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved. You first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, he has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised himself from the dead. Why did he do all that? so his blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven, of what he did on the cross, and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins, and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it, can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I am sorry, for being a sinner, I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work, because you only have one life to live for Him, and you don't want to waste it away by the devil.